Okay. Um, so this event will be or is being live streamed to YouTube and then will be on the Pratt SOA um, YouTube channel for anyone who wants to come back and watch it. We have a lot of people coming back. So um, if you want to share the video to someone who can't come now. But um, 6.05, so let's uh, get started. Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Jared Rice. I'm the head of Pratt Futures. Um, Pratt Futures is a student-led um, lecture series um, led by students, organized by students, and we try and bring um, with various uh, student members or members of the student body request as well as topics uh, they request. And we try and uplift voices and um, organizations that we believe should be getting more voice and that the student body is interested in. And as such, I'm really excited for this project today. Um, um, Valeria actually uh, was had a big hand in bringing this, so uh, I'll hand it over to you to give the introductions. Hello, um, so I'm Valeria. I'm the president of the Latin American Architecture Lab at Prada Soe. And our group focuses on celebrating and elevating our culture as um, international students. And I think we decided to make this event not only to celebrate um, international work and in migra migration in terms of design and landscape architecture, but also to see um, the transition of a person of becoming who they are nowadays, um, transitioning from one country to another and also um, gaining experience from international um, scopes of work, which I think it's very important. So with that said, uh, I'm gonna now introduce our guest speaker for the night, which we're really excited as part of the Latin American community to have him. Um, Daniel Vassini is the current creator, uh, the current crea creative director for West 8, an award-winning international landscape architecture and urban design firm. He graduated with a master's in architecture from SIARC and has taught design studios at Syracuse School of Architecture and Harvard Graduate School of Design. Vassini's design principles focus on approaching and creating landscapes that are unique and responsive to its location, culture, and society. He has an extensive background on large-scale projects, ranging from master plans to urban plans and infrastructures. His work investigates transformative designs that address climate and sustainable design solutions. Prior to joining West 8, Vassini worked at SOM Urban Design and Planning Studio. He's also a recipient of the Medal Prize for the Malecón of Puerto Vallarta and Fulbright Scholar by the Institute of International Education. This student-led discussion dives into the understanding of designing abroad and what it means to blend our design culture with other societies through the universal language of design. Lastly, we decided to close with a very special quote that really caught our attention by Daniel. And it's, it says, <laughs> Landscape architecture is about illusion, says Daniel Vassini. You create an illusion when you see it from far away, when you get closer, when you're under it. With nothing more to add, thank you, Daniel, for being here to celebrate land, international work, and migration. And we're so excited to have you. You can take it on. <laughs> thank you, Valeria. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, this is my first time talking to Pratt students and I'm also aware that there might be some other guests uh, that some students have shared this invitation online. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, it's also nice to see some faces uh, sometimes uh, doing this uh, webinars or lectures remotely. Um, it's, it's a new medium, so we try our best to do it as interactive as we can due to the fact that we don't have an audience in front of us, it's all virtual. So sometimes uh, watching some faces does help to read if people is actually uh, entertained or perhaps um, I need to change my tune of voice to, um, to caught your attention. So with that said, I'd like to, um, you know, before I get started, I'd like to announce that um, I have prepared a small slideshow in which uh, speaks a bit about uh, the intent of this group of students uh, related to the heritage of uh, Latin American backgrounds and cultures. So I hope that uh, my narrative uh, 
help illustrate to some of you a little bit of the background in which I come from, in which I grew up. And now as I get more senior, perhaps I realize a little bit more the surrounding in which I grew up, which definitely influence, uh, let's say, the mindset and in the way how I approach design, no doubt. And um, I think it's very critical, as I heard from you, Valeria, it's very important that if you see uh, the story, uh, it's really critical, you all as a student, that we elevate, no matter from which background you come from, uh, from those audiences, what really matters is that you as a young student should always search for your own identity, uh, understand it, where it's coming from, and enhance it and celebrate that. And that's part of heritage. And uh, multicultural backgrounds is actually something very rich to be aware of. And um, I'd like to uh, perhaps uh, leave that in your mind. With that, I will commence and start to share my screen. And um, uh, hopefully after the presentation, we can also go through a series of um, uh, questions and answers. So I'd like to start right here and uh, just give me a second before I publish um, for Bleed. So um, this actually was uh, an exhibition that occurred in New York at the Jewish Museum. And as you can see, it's a tapestry. It's a very beautiful tapestry and a very large scale um, in which it was the outer creator, uh, Bruno Marx. And uh, when I was uh, relocated from uh, Rotterdam uh, to New York to run uh, the creative direction, of the office in New York. Uh, this, this was actually my first exhibit and visit. And um, I like to go back in time because it has had a, a cure since uh, back in 2016 and a few years went by We're already, you know, the five years went through. But what is really important is that this was for my first time uh, getting in touch with the identity of uh, Latin America after spending 10 years in Europe. And uh, speaking a little bit, what I prepared today before we enter into, um, let's call it the West Tech projects, um, is to really look, uh, in this case, I decided to pick the background in which my family come from, from my mother's side, which is Venezuela. And you can see here a beautiful picture of uh, what we say, El Avila, or El Cerro El Avila, which is an immense, uh, beautiful valley where you can see in the background, where you can see the city of Caracas sleeping in front of the Sultan, uh, which is uh, the Avila. What is really interesting about this photograph, it's, it's just in the 1800s. And as you can see in this map, you can see the Caribbean Sea in the front. Uh, you can see here the relief of the mountains. This is uh, a map done um, to document and really much a base to verify that the city of Caracas, like many of the Latin American cities you may know, depart from um, the Indian laws or leyes de Indias in Spanish, which is actually um, a document in which uh, Philip II uh, used to make sure that urbanization was organized in the proper way, which pretty much inherit in the urbanization mindset. And this has obsessed my life uh, in my practice and in my research until today on why this is the DNA of our cities and urbanization and, and, and how we grew the parting from this cell. And uh, in this case, specifically Caracas is truly honoring Leyes de Indias one-to-one. -one. You can feel the grid. You can see the plasma you're in the middle. And over time, it just grew into what today is a metropolis, which is no longer one center, but it's polycentric. As you can see over here with my cursor specifically right there, that's the city center. And the city uh, actually grew uh, to the east of the city. And uh, right here is where now many of the polycenters are situated. Another one right there, and another one on the, on the west side. This is how actually the streets used to look alike and what is very fascinating, you can immediately uh, relate to that uh, heritage from the Hispanic uh, culture, which you see in many of the Latin American cities. And when you visit South of Spain, actually, you feel a lot of the similarity with Andalusia region, 
with those beautiful window bays, which was pretty much the internet of the moment. This was where people was FaceTiming with the neighbors or perhaps uh, young teenagers were sitting in the inside of the window looking to the outside, just as you see in this photo, which is part of the culture of exhibiting big windows to exhibit yourself. Uh, you are not allowed conservative families, you know, to leave your house without you know, the companionship of your elders to go to school. So being at the window with your best fashion is pretty much part of where we come from to exhibit yourself. And this is very important to kind of remind ourselves where we come from. And this is not too old ago. Maybe this picture was taken, as you can see, in 1920s of the 20th century. And those houses, perhaps they have one or two window bays, but the intent is that in the inner house, there was always a patio and a courtyard where paradise was held. And this is where landscape architecture in the city departed. As cities were very urban and the landscape outside the city was truly natural. And in the inside was the first time you had control landscape in the patios in the courtyard, which is very much coming from the Moorish uh, multicultural background that Spain went through um, in, uh, for 800 years in the south of Andalusia. So the Koya is inherited also as well by the Romans. It's uh, something that is very Mediterranean culture and in climates like Caracas and many parts of Latin America, it's very common to see this paradise and intimacy. But then urbanization came through. And for me, it fascinated me a lot because as I grew up, my family always told me the stories of the city pre-urbanized and how it looked like that this was just open vast land and little by little it just grew up and now it's a total urbanized city. And you can see here what we call the trace of a line becoming a road and me as an urban planner really creates meaning to understand that every line you draw really has a truly meaning on plan and eventually becomes something in physicality. And here you can see, this is Paseo La Castellana in Altamira when there was not nearly urbanized, but you can already see some sort of Hausmannian look of a straight line with tree on the sides. So a first intent of urbanization to accommodate vehicles was starting to happen. So with little oops here and there where modern nature in places like in Latin America is pretty much present. One of the first things when uh, many of the um, Spanish colonizers came to Latin America, they were very much impressed about the abundance of nature in the tropical, the subtropical environment, like the Avila was such a presence in the city, like in Bogota or in Mexico City. So nature is really flamboyant and sublime, really making you dream, as you can see, allowing the tree to be there in the middle of urbanization is actually something fascinating. So for me, it's the first mix about living in nature while most of the Europeans and cities are actually truly urban in their core and then nature spreads out. And then in the um, early 18th century, it got green again. But what is really fascinating for me, specifically speaking, which is the subject in which I focus, which is you know, the research of metropolis, is that in 1900, 1900, you can see the photo on the left, what they used to call the Caracas of the Red Roofs. And you can see in 1948, how the city is transforming so quickly. So the effect of urbanization really taking in less than 50 years, making a huge impact, transforming the city like you could not imagine, losing that colonial aspect that prevailed for almost 400 years. All of a sudden, urbanization was there Petroleum was discovered and brought wealth and resource to the city to be modernized. In a nutshell, you can see how that mid-rise buildings start to float in the 1950s, which really commenced to understand an efforts of modernization, of transformation, and in a way erasing a little bit that colonial past to becoming a metropolis, to compete with Rio de Janeiro, to be in the top of that time, the style was international style, brutalism, modernism, concrete, and be as a statement of a city that actually is something as a reference to the world that you should study, those of you interested in this movement. And it didn't come just with buildings and freeways, road. It also come with landscape architecture, 
when it was decided to commission one of the top best landscape architects at that time, Roberto Bullermarsk, designing Parque del Este. As you can see it here in a beautiful Bossa Nova, Boss Art, but at the same time, modern landscape architecture, as you can see in Parque del Este as the end and the start of an urbanization called Altamira. In the back, you can see the airport and the urbanization of Santa Fe. This is about in the mid century of the 20th century, the 1950s. And you can see the power of his design transforming the city with a park for the people. This was quite revolutionary while New York already had a central park for 100 years was the model to see and adopt. Therefore, a park for the city of, for the people was quite important to make sure that the urban sprawl will not eat all the land and allow spaces for recreation and wellness and disperse. And at the same time, an exhibit of tropical and subtropical environment for their citizens. And at the same time, allowing culture to be a place to gather and meet, which is truly the essence of democracy. So when you see uh, countries of the world that design and develop public spaces, it's a truly reflection that they are inhabiting a state where it is absolutely democratic to let people to express and come and meet. Uh, countries that no longer design public spaces and enables public spaces for people means that our countries are becoming authoritarian because they don't want people to come express. So in the 50s, Venezuela was truly a reflection of a model for the world in terms of their democracy and modernism. And this is something that we feel proud as Latin American because it was truly the utopian mind to see and look back, look at this beauty, look at this composition was truly innovative at the time Many cities of the world are jealous to have a park like this, and it's really a jewel that shall be protected. And this doesn't come from free. This really brought a renaissance. And as you can see, a little bit of the hint of those type of house and patios and courtyards as I spoke before. And the young lady in the middle is a promising fashion designer, Carolina Herrera, who had the pressure to design all the way to Jackie Kennedy, to Michelle Obama, and it's truly a reflection of that multicultural background of that melting pot called Venezuela, which many of the Latin American culture carries, which is truly the richness of something called mestizaje, in which we shall feel very proud. And I feel proud because I'm also a product of mestizaje, which makes human history and our DNA much richer when we mix a mimbo. Therefore, Latin America is in the 1950s and beyond to the finishing of the 20th century was truly looked as a utopian because of modernism and seeing Brazilians starting from scratch and reinventing themselves into this Renaissance, taking away and moving on the side and saying no to all the classic orders that was very much copies in capitals of Latin America, not to mention DC, inspiring a European stylish, but instead reinvent and find our identity so modernism, the Latin American modernism was in search of who we are and said no longer to the neoclassic borrow styles of the Greek and the Romans, which is truly important. And perhaps with the movements that we're going through today is actually a question that is always valid to ask. As you can see in this case, in this exhibition, uh, um, it's very important to understand in that research that is trying to find new meaning in this case, a project by Rogelio Sarmone in Bogota, the contrast of La Plaza de Toro, and at the same time, borrowing the materiality and that landscape to emerge into these beautiful residential towers. As also as well as Tomas Sanabria and a truly modern building. But at the same time, if you look at the picture at the back, you can see the texture and how is doing a very simple job of framing the landscape, which is quite beautiful and poetic. And a lot to learn, specifically speaking to one of our masters. And in this case, I'd like to dedicate a little time because he actually brought a lot to the modern movement and at the same time to the modernization of a country. And these are his cute buildings for the Expos in Venezuela in Montreal, is Carlos Raul Villanueva. 
actually fascinating story because he was actually born in London and educated in France because his parents were diplomats at that point in time. And although he was Venezuela born in London, he came back to Venezuela when he was 30 years old. So imagine yourself, you're not even 30 yet, that at 30 years old, you go back to a country you've never been. And therefore he decided to go back because he felt truly Venezuelan in the way how he grew up in an embassy and surrounded by his family. That says a lot. And he moved back and it had a very strong mindset to build and search for that new identity, not to copy, but instead to understand the climate and the context and react to the context. At that time, modernism was very much in conflict about the concept of tabula rasa, erase everything and start from scratch and put it where the buildings are imposed on the landscape. But instead, he tried to reverse that equation. Here's a little bit of the beauty, very much fascinated by the environment, by light, by temperature. And this is a part of the sections and at the same time, the plan of the three cubes, where he's trying to describe all of the diversity and contracts that a country could offer. And that was his inspiration and metaphor. And on the right, you can see an early illustration in collaboration with artist Jesus Soto, which is called a penetrable. And here you can see actually a piece of that penetrable that you can visit in LACMA in Los Angeles, which really the illusion of the sun actually transmitted to this glare and the movement, which is a kinetic art which was part of the movement of Jesus Soto, in which I felt very much influenced as being the teacher of my grandfather. And therefore I always heard about this eccentricity on this gentleman, which I believe influences very much in the sensibility for the art. So at that time, let's call it like this, in the beginning of the century, late 1800, early 1900, many of the American cities were very much investing in campus design throughout the US and Latin America. Education was really at the forefront to move away from farming and urbanizing and bringing knowledge to the people. And here you can see La Universidad Central de Venezuela, UCB, in which was really a beautiful plan designed by Carlos Raúl Villanueva, but inherited in this case by other planners, where he definitely transformed it and adapted to be unique and to be responding to the context. And I was always fascinated as I was studying and visiting and understanding and researching about the UCB. Every time I navigated, I was really trying to understand the reason why it was conceived in this way, but I was always fascinated by the fact that it's almost like a living organism in the city and how it's truly changing with the environment and the seasons and how he very much tailored that. And as you can see, the project is fairly organic for the 1950s. Beautiful drawings that was in the exhibition. I'm obsessed about the drawings and the scale because this is the scale in which I practice. And you can see how the buildings are elegantly placed under the landscape. And by just using two colors, you can definitely understand the expression of shadow, texture, hierarchy, composition, all design with purpose and with intentionality, with a very well set up structure. As you can see, this is something that is actually a UNESCO heritage and is uh, fully protected. And one of his major buildings with the Aula Magna was, is truly a unique piece. And as you can see in the section, he was always thinking from the early beginning that architecture needs to be in collaboration with the environment, but also with artists. So he really had the opportunity to invite the world best artists to come and collaborate with him. And it started actually with Calder, as you may know, one of the most important artists of America who spent some time in Paris and came back to the US. But one of his first pieces of work was actually working with Villanueva in the Alna Magna. And you can see his inspiration. This is the same section you saw before. Looks almost like a fish. It was very uh, sublime and the interpretation and how that came in plan into this kind of beautiful petals in which we feel very much attached to and then put them to fly above in the theater, which really was something for me that I always understood from the beginning 
how this beauty could influence me in the sensibilities by just being here without even noticing. But it's truly important now, as I grew up adult, how important was this through my education years? As you can see, it's just fascinating, stunning, and beautiful. And these shapes, which is pretty much color shapes to his outer, it's actually something that I can tell you, it does influence me every time I do plans. Calder and Villanueva became very good friends and he called him El Diablo, the devil, due to his power of imagination and the fact that he will challenge each other about what the commission will become. You can see Calder trying to put him two horns on his head in this photograph. And Calder was so fascinated by what's going on in the feasts in Venezuela as an epicenter of culture like Paris in the 20s, that he was writing to Elvis Kelly to say, you should come here. They're giving me lots of work. This is the place to be. Don't even hesitate. These are these other great artists. And therefore, it's very important because this is truly a record of the Latin American epicenter of utopia to try to research what is the meaning of that identity and artists trying to express an opportunity to really express art, light, and environment. Here you can see the movement in this case of brutalism, but with the slender silhouette of this bossa nova curvature, framing the light and the landscape, providing shape and microclimate, but at the same time being sublime through the passerelles of the walking ways of the city university. Car free walk was the statement. Come and walk one campus through the other one. Allow light to create microclimate, no air conditioning, free ventilation. These were the concepts in which a world like today very much still needs and they still valid, which has to do with sustainability and working with the environment. Watch the beautiful the reason why today continues to be heritage. And that's why I bring this today to share a little bit of the knowledge in which I believe in this case still inspire me and gives me energy to continue. You can see the beautiful light and the way how the wall doesn't touch the ceiling. Everything is so designed and custom and tailored, but at the same time, beautiful and pure. And it's still there and it's very much beloved and protected. How the facade is really working with the lights and the shadow cast from the top to the tall areas to allow more light um, and actually the continuation of working with murals throughout, in which he invited a selection of artists that populated throughout the whole UCLA, in the inside, in the courtyards, and the outside. And actually, this is my favorite, when you see the shepherd, actually a beautiful piece of art. And you can see one of the biggest mural at that time in the world due to the length working as well with Alejandro Otero, who is an, also another member of the Kinectic Movement. And in those murals, they were really not just inviting uh, international artists, but at the same time, in that collaboration, empowering local artists that then came of great rename. So you can see here the UCB and the work of Villanueva is something that I truly identify because it's not just about landscape, it's also about master planning. It's also about working with the environment. It's also about architecture, place making, and how you make sure that you integrate culture into the plan. On a city, the same uh, Avila that you see in the background that I show in the first photo with an urbanized city that although you can see skyscrapers, the immensity of the mount of the mountain overwhelms and make that the high rise still are not bigger than any of the mountains height. You can see as well a little bit of what I used to see every day when I went to school driving by this beautiful uh, Soto piece uh, sitting in Autopista del Este, which remains there. And that immense presence is truly telling you something almost like art on La Torre Eiffel, where you can see a relationship and you relate with the silhouette and the backdrop of the mountains. So the dialogue of the landscape, art and sculpture for us is truly important since the conception. And to not even speak about the sunset time or in the evenings. And this is truly poetic, actually something 
to be admired and protected. So these are all of the different layers in which I be in and feel influence, which is part of the tropical environment and goes all the way from Villanueva to Fruto Vivas with a simplicity, me as performing today as a landscape architect, the notion of combining houses, living houses on the trees due to the presence of that tree canopy that we have in the country, it's truly a sublime experience to define the idea of uh, defeat gravity and float among the canopies of the trees. So I think it's very important because this also, you can see a relationship with Nehemiah, but at the same time, looking at the illusion of the tropics. So how do you adapt it to the tropic climate? Not very far, they're all at the end, we are influenced from Villanueva and his simplicity of, in this case, the little house called Sotavento, like this was what modernism meant. And you can see here in the 50, just living in hammocks in a house at the beach with the palms in the outside, wooden chairs that they look from the 1800, probably from the grandma, but at the same time, the house very modern with brisoles and have the concept of the inside outside. Perhaps if you close your eyes, you might get confused between uh, Richard Meyer and uh, Carlos Raúl Villanueva. So there is a lot of relationship in this case. This is our first house from me in the tropical style, which at the end of the day, these are all the sensibilities and sensor that when I came back from school, they were waiting for me, looking back to the Avila. So this is what resembles in my memory. And this is actually the sensibilities that before I went to Los Angeles truly remains in my DNA. And to conclude uh, this chapter, I think it's very important. The reason why it's important to celebrate our background and to remind where we grew up and to take that with us all the way through to help inform our profession. And in this case, Carlos Cruz Diaz, he actually did this amazing mural, but at the same time, pavement, in which what I do in my profession, I became obsessed about pavement. And me as a landscape architect today, this is actually something that I learned without noticing and how I care about the relationship of the horizontals and the vertical. To my surprise, mating all the way to from Maiketia, Caracas, to the Walt Disney Concert Hall, just in front of Dudamel, who does uh, the director of the orchestra at a point in time in LA. I went to school at SciArc, actually not so far away from the Walt Disney Concert Hall. At that time was under construction and was looking for funding until Walt Disney, the company decided to fund it all the way. And it came a reality after the Bilbao effect, not before. At that time, Eric Owen Moss was the director and I had the pleasure for the first time to have freedom. When you do your master's degree, it's really a moment in which after you did your undergrad, you really allow yourself to think, to research and find your way. And in this case, it was a metropolitan research and design conducted by this gentleman, Michael Speaks, who was truly writing an amazing program, allowing us to analyze the metropolis. And in the, 19, in the 2000s, uh, the growth of the cities and the sprawl of American city was truly an awareness. And there was actually a moment in time that we were questioning ourselves, what are we gonna do with the city if they keep growing? And the majority of the population in the future will live in cities. Therefore, we need to care for our cities. At that point in time, I decided to move beyond my architecture background to start in what we know as urban design, urbanism and landscape architecture, which is the practice in which I do soon after I finish my master. And that gave me the opportunity to start in the urban design studio at SOM together with Phil Enquist, where SOM is pretty well known as a firm that does architecture per se, but there were a department of planning and urban design led by this gentleman, Phil Enquist, and I feel very proud to call him my mentor in my early years and educate me in the sensibilities of urbanity and the procession of placemaking. Before I left Chicago and I came to Rotterdam, as you can see in the background. So today I did only one project and I decided that I will split this conversation with you in half. The first part, a little bit of the background, 
the heritage and how I grew up, in the sensibilities that really informed today my practice, in sharing with you the heroes of a point in time that perhaps you didn't know, or now you know, and you can research in the future. So West State is actually the firm that has offered me a home for the past 10 plus years, in which I've been running as creative director in the North American side, after being 10 years working very closely with Adrian Jose, the founder, and a team in which I'm very proud to share. So this is a recent photo of one of my team members actually at Drexel Square. And I wanna make sure I put them here because I'm sure they will see this lecture across on YouTube. And I just need to say thank you to them because otherwise all the work we do wouldn't be possible without having all of them together. And I'm sure Valeria know who had a practice with us a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, Valeria, um, you had the yeah. opportunity to actually uh, uh, meet them all and practice with us in this intense environment. So here you can see a photo of the studio. The studio is really focused not in architecture. We're focused in urban design, in landscape, in public space design. And it's a different meaning because we really shift the, something what we call scale. And at the end of this presentation, I will speak about scale, which is truly relevant for the profession. The firm started in Rotterdam, and it's truly a firm that is pretty much tied to the legacy of a country where planning is pretty much part of the DNA. The Netherlands is a country, as you may know, that gain terrain from water, and therefore they really much plan every time they build because they need to be very much aware where is water, how they manage water, how they get protected from water, how they protect their land, etc. This is the city of Rotterdam. As you can see, it's a port, former port, the city center. You can see the docklands and all the way to the out. You can see actually the Northern Sea. The city of Rotterdam, this is actually the port. We are located right here as a city center and every gray footprints that you can see is what we call the portlands. This is actually a domain of the port of Rotterdam. This is something that they hold the jurisdiction and the authority and they have to make sure that they are not in conflict with the city. And because the city is right at the center and already grew to his limit, the port itself had no other choice that grow all the way west, as you can see. And in this plan, actually, you can see how the port has been growing, gaining land from the sea. It is very important, as you understand, economy and the economy of the world has to grow at least 2 to 3% per year. So the same should happen to the port. So the Port of Rotterdam needs to enable space to grow, to be able to compete with China and be able to compete with the Port of Shanghai and be the first port of Europe. And therefore, that means an immediate conflict with the land, an immediate conflict with urbanization pressure. And the best option is to grow to the outside. When you grow, obviously you impact ecology, you impact land, you impact and affect water. But it's very important that when you do that, and responsible that you give back. So everything that you see in yellow is actually ecology, new shoreline that has been developed to give back for the impact of the amount of growing. So this is very critical and that's the essence of the practice of planning where you have to be careful where you take away, therefore you put back, and what is the trade-off that you're doing? This is pretty much in the DNA on how we practice, and that is very critical for your awareness and understanding. And here, how much we grew in land, you wanna see what this means? Check this out. This is the footprint and the immensity of a board growing named Hoog van Holland, and continues to grow all in this case constructed landscape. This is landscape gained from the sea by simply pumping sand into the water, dredging in other words, to create this effect of building with nature. This is purely technology learned from the Dubai era about building islands and now manifested here in this form of industrialization to create new land. And as landscape architects, that's what you do, you create new land. And in the heritage or in the school of landscape architecture in the Netherlands, 
different than the French school, different than the Italian school of landscape architecture, has to do with constructed landscapes. Constructed landscape means men uh, made by design, made by nature, made by landscape architects in general. But it's also part of an economy. The more you pump, the cheaper it is. That is also at the same time a part of the mechanism of an economy that is all the time pumping sand for many reasons to make sure that the soils doesn't move, to make sure that you gain back specific levels. It's really an economy of the country per se. Therefore, this chapter, what I'm about to embark, it truly speaks on the essence of our practice as we state, different than an architecture office. We are truly uh, committed to what a territory means, in this case, the Netherlands, and the relationship of the cities and the landscape. As I said before, cities grow, and as they tend to grow, they eat their landscape. Countries like the Netherlands, they are not as big as America, so therefore the amount of landscape, countryside remaining, is quite small. So you got to be very careful in your planning and in the allowance of building the city that you don't eat away the heritage of the landscape left. You need the landscape for agriculture purposes. You need the landscape to feed back your population. Here is a piece of that boulder. Boulder means uh, basically land gained from water. And boulder, as you can see here, needs to canalize and needs to store and manage the water. Therefore, you cannot get rid of the water all of a sudden. It becomes the structure, it becomes the bones of the land. So you can see this radiation of the water because you need to store it and move it. Otherwise, you do a big lake. And therefore, you can make new land. The boulder, obviously, it's a combination of dikes, levels of water, different levels. Windmills in the 18 and in the 16 and the 1500 to be able to pump the water out from one level to another one. Today is all done electronically. And the obsession in this case of our design director and mentor, Adina Hauser, is pretty much about understanding that landscape, which is in the essence, in the way how we practice our profession. And I wanted to put you in contrast because when you see the antique boulders from North Holland, you can find a scale. These boulders were not made by tractors or machine. They were made by cattle. They were made, specifically speaking, by machinery that was of a different scale than today. You can see here the dike, for instance, you can see a road, you can see a farm enclosed by trees to feel more intimate, and not in the vast open. And here, for example, a former lake where you can see how you control the rivers by creating dikes on the edge of the river. You can see how you canalize and store the water to create new land. You can see here the farmhouse, and in some cases, and much of these ones are actually windmills, as you can see here, to pump out the water. And if you look even closer, you can see numbers. Each one of these numbers means a piece of land you can sell. So in the 1600, this became really the economy, not some different from the economy of today of the port. So it became truly an engineering experience of, you know, what if we transform this water into land? We can sell it, we can gain capital, we can do agriculture. So it truly becomes a, almost a business into itself. You can see the boulders of today. You can see that the scale is way bigger. You can see that the canal of the waters are becoming smaller and smaller. You can see as well the combination of the dike that is not just a dike, but it's also a freeway for vehicles. It has a train line, it has a bike lane, and it has windmills. So it becomes that engineering is a multifaceted combination. It is not just one thing, it's doing many things and it's multi-layered. So to conclude a little bit on the philosophy in which we practice, it's truly about that a new land, which means a new Netherlands, means new ecology. It means a new economy. It means an area for recreation as you give back to that economy you're creating, as I show you in the board. It means security, because when you build dikes, you're protecting yourself from sea level rise. And therefore, you create a new land, reason of the DNA 
that the practice of landscape architecture is truly this essence when you come from the school or the Dutch school of landscape architecture and urbanization. One day, this is just a thesis and we can share this in academia, we speculate for how long the Port of Rotterdam will continue to grow. Will it make it all the way to England? Well, not. Perhaps then you need to start thinking. And the reason why we are in this profession is because you need to think, you need to have the best idea. You need to imagine perhaps tomorrow we create new islands to plan the expansion of the port connected by a trail. And this is part of the infrastructure system that, as you can see, for example, in the Los Angeles Long Island port, you can see the scale in which we're talking about. And these are almost a form of machinery, pretty much compare uh, five times of the size of a city. So if cities are growing to spread out to immensity, imagine how ports and airports are growing in the future. What is the impact to the environment? So that's something very important to us for ourselves. I'd like to actually uh, conclude uh, with a project in which is very important to me, as Valeria mentioned, this uh, gave me, together with Studio 314, the opportunity of winning a gold medal for the foundation of architects in Mexico. They don't have one for landscape architects. So we end up winning the medal of architects for an urban project. And this project was El Malecón of Puerto Vallarta. It's very important to understand something before I present the project. But if we go back to Latin America, I want to show with you this fact. Latin America, from Mexico all the way to Argentina, is the continent that has the most urbanized developing countries in the world. We have more urban cities than even China, than even America alone. And that's something very important because that means that needs a lot of urban planner, need a lot of landscape architects that take care of their city, cities that needs to adapt to growth, city that need to upgrade their infrastructures, city that needs to become more environmental friendly to really defeat climate change and be more sustainable and CO2 footprints. So there is a huge economy in Latin America for all those urbanized cities that they need to be taken care of. So I share this with you, just as a message that there is a lot of work to do moving forward in terms of cities in the world. And Latin America carries one of the biggest portfolio of city and cities with huge population with a lot of amount of people living in them. So they're very dense and has in the future will have the same amount of the whole population of the US. So today about 216 million people live in these cities. And those cities are creating economies on its own. So they feed themselves out of their own economy because of the ecosystem that they are. So cities are very important to understand that in the way how they grow, but most important cities, they also need to take care of public space because if they grow and they don't allow public spaces, then there is no space for recreation. There is no space for breeding. There is no space for society to exchange, which is critical for the peace and health and mental health of the people of the cities. So there is a second role on the role of open spaces on parks and streets that they need to be conceived. It cannot just be pure development, 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 and real estate. So to start with Puerto Vallarta, actually it's a city. It used to be a village. And as you can see here, the fine grain, if you read, you can see how it has grown almost like any other Latin American city. But what is very strange is just a place where you will go and spend the weekend then people stop spending the weekend, but they will spend a week. Then they start to spend the month. They no longer went back to Guadalajara or any other related city. They stayed. So Puerto Vallarta becoming a true city. And if you can see here, right here, follow my cursor. This is the origin of the true city. It was just one kilometer long, this. And today the sprawl has begun and commenced 
This is only 20 years. Therefore, it truly really gives you an understanding how quick urbanization can take place. And if you don't design for it, it starts to eat away nature. So it's very critical to protect the resources of the location before it starts growing. Here is a photo I actually took the moment I land from the airport. Over here, you can see the whole resort town on your front, the marina shopping centers. This is what they call the new area of Vallarta. And right here in the back, you can see the old town, no towers, this all low rise, very small, very pretty. This is actually the latest real estate, as you can see. Real estate designed by Philippe Stark. Nothing wrong with that, but you can see the presence on the beach. And what that means is truly becomes, you know, the second destination, perhaps why not my first destination for living, if you can work remote in the world today. The celebration of the arrival, pretty grandiose, the pink of Barragan, and the axis towards those towers. Of course, gated, which again states the importance where is the public space and the spaces to gather. And we understand it's private and we understand that there needs to be security. But how do you give back? And how will you do that? Maybe by providing access to the beach. The walls, something very important and present in Latin America today, which truly divides within the society is truly a presence. Can it be done better? Just observation as you go through and navigate through the new beach. And this is the remaining access for the people, which doesn't make it very inclusive, isn't it? So this is the new Vallarta. This was the Vallarta design in the future, in the 20th century. And people very strategically, if they don't go to the beach in front of it, because it's right at the doorstep of those towers, Actually, the other thing that they do, they go to the shopping mall, so it's very safe. And therefore you go back to your tower. And the reason why it's so important to invest in public spaces, public spaces that feel safe, where people can go and meet. And therefore you allow society to meet each other. And people who's curious to learn who lives in that tower, they sometimes go to the shopping mall to spot them and understand who they are or people who play the male guy to just come to this tower and get a glimpse of that world behind those big towers. So at that time, uh, we had the opportunity to meet the mayor. This is actually the city center. You can see the church at the end. You can see the hill coming all the way to the backdrop of the beach. And he asked us a question where he said, I need to invest in the public space and I don't know where should I invest it. Do you invest it in front of that shopping mall and create a new waterfront in the new city? Or do you invest it in actually in the city center, in the core where the city was born and try to revitalize the streetscape of this, actually the old Malecon. And we definitely said, you should definitely invest in the city center. You should definitely invest in who you are and give back to people what they understand they are. And this is the Malecon, and you can see it's conformed basically by 10 or 12 blocks. This is about one kilometer long, starts right here at the Plaza of Pescadores and finish right here at the municipality building and the church and the city hall. It's a very simple, almost a colonial creed composed by 12. But what is very beautiful about, there is a jog on the bay the jog that makes a space or a room, we call it a plaza, but this jog makes this another destination. So you have a sequence and instead of being one feet all, when you come at the end, the space open to have a bay at the view. All the streets come to the water, which is very classic. So every neighbor has a view to the water. And the church becomes the landmark at the end, as you saw in the first photo. So that's the end of the destination. And the arrival at Plaza de Pescadores gave us a quick understanding how this place was functioning. This is us meeting with a young mayor like Carlos Raúl Villanueva. He was just 30 at that time. Here you can see him right there. This is Adrian. 
having a conversation, trying to convince him that definitely he should invest in public space. And that is actually the moment in which he felt secure. And he had one question. He said, I need to upgrade the infrastructure. But after I upgrade the infrastructure and all the drainage and all the roads and all the civil, I don't know what to do on top of it. Should I copy paste what I used to have in the past? Or should I do something new? And then he said, let me show you. Because for us, it's very important to understand rather quick. And when we went to walk, this is what he showed us. It was already demolished. And the whole waterfront was gone. And we could even understand what was in the past other than researching by photography. But we understood one thing. There were some coconut palms remaining. As you can see, there is one every block, which provides almost no shade. So it was a place that had a lot of sun, therefore not very comfortable, getting very hot. And the authenticity of it wasn't really that a shine. We made our research, we worked with historian, and they were all telling us that actually there was uh, no history relic to be maintained. So we went to our studio and we said to the mayor, we'll be back in two weeks and we will present you a series of recommendations. Excuse me, but this is in Spanish because this is truly the same presentation we present to the mayor to show him the project and the potential. So I'm gonna share the same with you. The first one is we were working with engineering and he asked us, whatever you do, don't change the infrastructure that was bought. They're building it and you cannot change. I know you architects likes to change everything. So please don't do it. Say for sure, we ain't gonna change the profile. So here was actually the profile that was given. What I mean by that, I mean by the section. So they tell us the Malecon will be elevated for sea level rise. You can change that. The Malecon will have ramps for accessibility, but this profile and this length, this is the section in which you can operate. And we say, fine. Our first step was to say, we need to be less car dominated. This is about 10 years old. So our first move was to remove a car and to introduce one row of bike lane. It sounds very futuristic, but actually it's pretty standard. We took one row of car and the other one we gave it for the bikers. The next step was to enable part of the sidewalk for future terraces because business, they wanna sit in the front. Therefore we designated searing areas for the future business, which they were pretty content because that means more capital, more income for them. Then we introduced a tree on the sidewalk so we could provide shade under the terrace. And instead of having one row of palms every block, we introduced two rows of palms in every planter and extrude that throughout. And then last, we said, maybe we don't change it, but maybe we need to grow a little bit to the outside because it is getting very tight. And we know in summertime, a lot of people come and only one person, there will be hundreds of people in the front. So therefore we may need to grow a little bit to allow people to flow through the space, not to feel claustrophobic. The next one was to bring shade, 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 and make sure that when you bring shade, you don't block the view. There is always a conflict that if you bring trees to the waterfront, you're gonna block the view. But trees are important for the ecology and the microclimate. So I had to go and convince every neighbor. I had to knock every door and the mayor challenges, you won't win this. And I say, I will. And I did. I knocked every door. I worked with a local partner of Trecatorce and we explained, you're gonna get a tree for free. Where do you want it? And this is me making sure. So they say, please don't put it in front of my door. Please don't put it in front of my window. And you can see here how we're aligning the tree. You can see the door in oranges. You can see the windows and how we're strategically placing the tree off the window of the door. And therefore they take their present. So it's truly a matter of communication and it's truly a matter of being in touch with your neighbor and rolling up your sleeve and doing it one-to-one. -one. And that was pretty much for us a must because putting a tree was the success of the plan. 
a plant without trees is not successful. And here you can see a naked malecon. So I took this physical model and said, you want nothing, no tree, shade, sun, and heat. If we introduce a tree strategically placed, it will create immediately a more comfortable environment. And then the second layer is to introduce the palms that originally there were space every other block. And instead we said, as a part of the campaign of the mayor, to plant 200 palms in huge planters, they create clusters and we call them bouquet. So these are the planters with amoeba shapes. So that will create the extra layer of shade and microclimate. And because they're vertical, they're not like trees. They truly don't block. You see a fenestration, but you can still see the horizon of the ocean. But you can immediately feel comfort and microclimate. And you say, I want to be under, I want to be there. That is comfort. And that's part of what we do. We design spaces, but we also design the planting. And planting embraces and make the ecosystem of a place much intimate. You can see the shadow effect already on a sunset time, what it does to the maquette and the behavior. So it's very simple. We start with our pavement on the promenade. We call it a mosaic. We got our planter beds. We got the coconuts. And we end up with the bike lane. Therefore, it's pleasant to bike through. To conclude, we had to introduce a character furnishing, which is custom designed for this place which starts from the tree peat, the light, the bollards, and the benches, which we were very much inspired in indigenous motif, which I will explain in a moment. And that was also reflected on the railing, was truly honoring El Peyote as a part of their local culture to inspire the cactus. And why not? There was a desire for having flowers, which later we had to revise and also offer more shades with some pergolas that we will have at the end of the plaza. And flowers as a part of the display, people, humans, we always love flowers to have presence in actually our planted beds. And part of this effect of the furnishing was also to have, make sure that we could have an amazing illumination at night. Normally beaches, because of uh, thinking about security, they are over illuminated. And in this case, we just illuminated enough that you could see the moonlight and that you could also see the horizon. And this place was actually a place where Hollywood stars in the 20s were calm because of that moonlight effect. Here you can see Elizabeth Taylor actually was pretty much famous. Like now, Cabo San Lucas is Puerto Vallarta was the place. So we really wanted to create a, a narrative and a relationship with Hollywood as a part of the identity because of the success of the place. So Puerto Vallarta as a romantic place where people will come and this type of lighting would enable you that when you come in the evening, although it's dark, you can still see the water. And here you can see a hint of that effect that you can see in a dark blue, the shore, but it's not a blackout effect. So illumination is very critical for tourist destination. And here you can see a hint of that effect. So moving forward, and I think it was very important for us to tie with an extra layer of identity. And we were asking ourselves, which one is it? And what is the type of identity that we want to tie in? Uh, we felt from the beginning, and this was rather a moment of convincing the mayor, that working with river stones and pebbles was actually the way to go. Instead, they were thinking of changing all these pebbles and doing some sort of granite imported, and we say, you shall not. You should actually work with truly vernacular and autosomal materials from this location. And that was what we found. We simply visited in the place. You can see that they reflect the color of the sun and the geology of this location. So it's truly from this place. You can see how every other sidewalk is actually already in this standard. So we thought, why creating a new place with a new pavement that doesn't tie back to the urban tissue. Instead, we took the materiality of the location and we said to the mayor, we should go with this craftsmanship. People in your town know how to do it. You should employ local people that can craft this type of materiality. So we had an idea 
to actually invite in this case. And these are very tra traditional in Vallarta. They're called tapetes. And this is one in a public plaza. So we felt very inspired. And how can we make this a bit more contemporary? Vallarta and Nayarit has a very strong culture of the huichol, which all is a heritage, indigenous culture of the area. And we felt true that we need to honor them and give them space, give them a public realm in this location. So in this case, we invited a, 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 an artist specifically speaking to create his culture and to be inspired on his culture. So we commissioned him specifically, and this case is Fidencio Benitez in the name of the artist, to explore what would it be to draw a canvas about the history of this place. So he came with a beautiful narrative about the peyote as the sun, as the center of the universe for their culture, and all these beautiful creatures in which is part of their narrative and the storytelling and their language and their heritage. And we took that as an homage to a track thanks to his storytelling, and we actually follow each one of the figures, we trace them, we contour them, and we felt very inspired of the Wichol culture and give them a place in the Malecon as well. So it's not just contemporary, it is not historic, but it's tying back to their culture by putting back something we call the mosaic of Ayarta. Mosaic means a mix, means a mestizage of this, and it came through in this fashion. This is an artist's impression in which we abstracted. So we shouldn't be copying, in this case, the Bossa Nova of Copacabana, but we should actually feel inspired by both and create a new identity that emerges. And in this case, is the Mosaic of Vallarta, inspired by Fidencio Benitez's art. The mayor wasn't that convinced, but we say we should test it. We should test it. And therefore, he said, OK, let's make a small mock-up. We went to a site. We hire local craftsmanship. We make a few tests of the figures. And you can see the mayor immediately phoning on the phone call and canceling the granite pavers to go for the local autochtonal and made by the people this beautiful mosaic of Ayarta to become a reality. This was a sample, then we simplify it. This is the one we went for that everybody agrees and try to blend it. And here you can see there was a truly beautiful moment where fishermen, local people, daughters, everybody felt part of it and contributed and gave almost a donation with their hands and came to see it live. It was truly a moment of ownership and identity that they felt pretty much identified and proud. You can see here with the mechanism where the operator and the contractor with his daughter who studied architecture and CNC and milling and laser cutting the foam was a technique of a young and an adult generation coming together to make this happen on the pavement. And here you can see the result, actually quite poetic and beautiful, how the sun reflects on the stone, creates texture and how it comes out so lively, the Mosaic of Vallarta life. It was so popular that even fashion designer Pineda Kovalin took it as a theme and actually it was in her collection moving forward, as you can see in her beautiful scarf. So it became all of a sudden a connection with the identity in which we feel very proud. We went in two weeks, we presented the project and we only had six months to construct it. Therefore, the whole Malecon was immediately hands-on we were working remotely from the Netherlands with our local uh, practice as well, and together with our partner, Tres Catorce, and everything was made in Mexico, imported and designed, and the pride came in. As you can see, the manufacturer of the benches implemented the poles, the bollards, inspiring the peyote. We flew them over. This is in our studio with the bollards place, and therefore manufacturing Mexico. We flew them in the suitcase, and therefore they were installed for the first manager before the Malecon was open. We evolved the flower pole and after the success of the ritual culture, we actually managed to influence and convince the Botanic Garden to donate the Bungaville. And he had the same kind of pole and he said, Daniel, why don't we do instead Bungavilles instead of flowers? 
because nobody can reach those pots in the high and the wind sometimes is terrible. So we did some sort of kind of horns alike where this bungaville will just grow over time, learning from the botanic garden. Here the process of manufacture and manuring, here is the outcome of the bungaville. Today they must be much bigger. The railing also is part of the pavement. Here you can see the physical model which is part of the rapid prototyping technique and the implementation on site coming out where the famous uh, sea uh, horse is located at the end of the arc. The planter beds, very simple. They're all modular systems in which create these amoeba shapes to create this bouquet for Schaefer people. Here you can see the sample and the testing. The planter shapes in the floor while we were sending cat fowls live to be able to construct quick, quick, quick. This was actually constructed and manufactured fairly fast. And in less than six months, it was already there. Daniel? Hello. I think I think connection may have gone out briefly. Um, wait, sure we'll be back next let's time. wait. Yeah. Um. In the meantime, I do want to remind everyone we will have a question and answer session right after this. So if you if anything in here has really stood out and you have a question or just an overarching question. Uh, feel free to ask. Yeah. Um, it's completely voluntary, just clarifying that. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to assume you'll just come back in here in a second. Um, hmm. Yeah. Oh, it threw him out. Yeah, he's going to be back eventually soon. No. I think he's back connecting. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, hello? Hello, can you see me? Okay, yes. Something happened, I was kicked out, but I guess I will carry on. Okay, do you want to share your screen again or? Absolutely. Okay, cool. is, the, is the people still here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Very um, good, so. Yeah. Um, Maybe uh, there was a moment uh, in which uh, technology sometimes fails, correct? Um, so to conclude, uh, this is almost at the tailor end and maybe it's a good segue for questions and answer. But as I was saying, this was one of my first projects, an executed project. And I felt pretty content and satisfied. And it also was a lesson for me. And what I was most impressive was to understand when you design public spaces, actually the people own the spaces and before you know it, um, it's, it's for them. And um, they are the owners, they use it. Uh, they become the truly uh, spirit in which they protect the space. And it's something fascinating because when you see that happens, it's almost uh, uh, like a child who's born and um, it takes a life on its own. And I had never experienced that. And it's quite fascinating. Uh, here you can see the beauty when a recently new open uh, Malecon and people mingling, watching the horizon and uh, feeling the sublime in shade, in comforts, meandering through the water, uh, washing the shore and uh, being inspired 
allowing spaces to meet and greet, to exchange culture, to see and be seen. And that's very important on democracy to enable spaces and public spaces to be allocated for people and, and not just privatization of open space. And here you can see uh, the sequence coming to the end. What is quite interesting, and this is a phenomenon of the world that we live today, and I wanted to share this with you because once I was reading the newspaper and this advertising came into uh, my uh, web uh, screen and I saw all of a sudden and immediately recognized uh, the sculpture which we designed. This is a sculpture piece right in the Malecon in Vallarta. You could see right here, for instance, uh, the pavement of the design. But then very much confused because it says a best place to live in Portugal. And uh, I go back and say, how is that possible? But it is the, the world of today. Uh, our recognized newspaper in, uh, you know, in the hemisphere of the Latin American culture, promoting the best place to live in Portugal. Um, yeah, it's facts. It's facts that it is not true and that it is false. But I just want to let you know, this is the world where we live and to who should I complain? Uh, I don't know, but um, this is something you will come across. I would like to conclude to share that, you know, as I said before, when I was explaining a little bit of the Latin American heritage and modernization in the mid century, and the fascination for some of you that some of you think is impossible, there is some, uh, I would say, Western world and even uh, in, the, in, in Asia, there is something the humankind about in the way how we urbanize that it's very much geometric and it's very much unagreed. Even when you see the forbidden city in China, it's pretty much agreed and it's pretty much a tissue. So humans, as we uh, create our spaces to inhabit, they tend to be a tissue, a tissue. And a tissue is very important for the humans to coexist, to mingle, to forget your problems, to not be depressed. And when you grow cities in a suburban model, there is no longer a tissue, it's a sprawl. And uh, part of uh, being an urban designer is studying the tissue. And it's very important that when you do projects, you make a piece of a city, you make tissue to enable people to meet. And that's what I do per procession. I, I very much focus about drawing, this is at the studio, and drawing that tissue, which is something that needs to be rehearsed and learned. You don't learn to draw the cities you know, overnight. You have to practice, and you have to practice by drawing, and by drawing back on scale. This is something we did during COVID times in the studio. This is the biggest drawing we ever made. It's about seven meters uh, long. And you can see uh, how big it is in panels and impression. Um, this was one of actually my first drawing at the scale. This is a five kilometer long bay in, uh, in this case, uh, this is in Mallorca, Playa de Palma. It's a pilot project for regeneration of the coastline and uh, upgrade the tourism into an ecotourism. This is about 10 years old. But it's about that, it's about drawing the tissue. This is the Bay of Pasaya, also did with the team. And this is what has fascinated me a lot. This is Parque Central in Valencia and how the park edges are really much engaged with the park and how a park is inspired into the naranja, into the orange, which is truly the fruit of the location. And you can see that biomimicry in the shaping of that or in this case, the federal court in Germany, uh, which is in Karlsruhe, understanding how the landscape is actually waving into the tissue. And um, drawing is very important because it's actually part of how you articulate a design. Gothenburg with a speculation for the potential renovation of the docklands and how you can transform the docklands into an urban tissue for living and residential, so transforming post-industrial sites into future ecosystem and neighborhoods, or in Beirut, uh, creating a waterfront park into a future real estate area in the former port area, 
which is truly also a piece for people as well. So you can see here a lot of resemblance. So I've been a lot in my life and I wanted to share this with you. I'm very much passionate about drawing tissue and drawing tissue for cities and how you make a good piece of city. And there is no other way than actually drawing city themselves. This was a course I actually gave as a visiting professor in Syracuse University in the School of Architecture under Dean Michael Speaks, uh, my former actually uh, postgraduate advisor in SciArc, now as a dean. And he invited me to teach this fascination, almost obsession I have. And you can see here uh, teaching with the students where they were all exercising and practicing to learn how to draw cities. And we were doing an exercise of documenting American cities uh, in which they inhabit a park system. So you can see Baltimore, you can see Central Park, you can see Philadelphia, you can see Chicago, by Burham. So it was truly almost like a history class, but taking it through the drawing to really understand the tissue and the tissue as a humankind way of creating ecosystems of living in an urban form, but also with nature also in balance with nature. And this is actually was a fascinating result because it was also creating a library for ourselves about you know, our history and why cities are like this uh, and why they were inspired in certain order and uh, what is the negative space of the city so you understand the public versus the private. And uh, therefore that was the basically the structure of the studio. And then the last week, we let them free to draw the reverse, to draw the nature of that tissue and how organic and tissue comes together. They're both tissue in different kinds, one more geometric, the other one more natural. You can see the beauty of the expression, but you first need to learn the structure. So this is quite fascinating and hopefully one day we can document it on a publication. And you can see how it comes to there. there. So the landscape architecture is really one-to-one -one with urbanization. They go hand by hand. You can see the beauty and the poetic side of these drawings um, it was quite impressive. And I feel really uh, supported by the team who really did an amazing job. This is all done by them, by the students. They did a great work. And thank you to Dean uh, Speaks and to a state to make this possible. So thank you very much to the team here and I'm more than happy to take any questions than you might have. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm happy that you stand with me for all this time, despite sometimes the technical difficulties. Thank you. Thank you so much for an amazing presentation between the almost permaculturesque uh, work to like inclusion of artisans and the final piece on um, the importance of drawing. I know there's a ton of topics we can get into. Um, so for everyone in the um, everyone in the audience, we are opening it completely to questions. If you would like uh, to type in the chat your question, um, we can let you uh, we can read it for you, or you can read your own, or you can just raise your hand and we can call on you and you can say your own question if you don't feel like typing something. Um, but uh, to run the Q&A session, Valeria, I want to take it over. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. It was a fascinating presentation. I feel so inspired and it's been great to see your transition from a student to your, the professional and artist, architect, landscape architect you are nowadays. It, I guess something that like really stood out for me because I've always had this question of like, can you actually materialize landscape? And I think throughout the lecture, you have put it like very, uh, very clear. Uh, it's how do you like operate at larger scales, but also keeping it personal. And something that really stood up for me was the comment of the palm trees in the Puerto Vallarta um, project, because like it's like almost tracking the eyes of each of the inhabitants of that malecon. Uh, and I think uh, that's really fascinating. So I don't know if, because I think this also has to do a lot with like the material, the type of vegetation you use that also connects back to the actual inhabitants of where you're designing for. So I don't know if you can um, elaborate a little bit on, on that shift on scale that has to do with um, the actual infrastructure proposed versus the scale of the human 
and how do you connect with them? Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I think I think it's a it's a great question, and it's it's quite complex. Um, I like to say that um, uh, because of the background of the practical landscape architecture in the Netherlands, um, landscape architecture in the Netherlands, the school of landscape architecture in the Netherlands is pretty much a, a product one to one of uh, let's call it landscape engineering. So uh, landscape architecture here is equal to engineering. Um, and that has to do with the way how you actually construct these landscapes. You need to be an engineer to understand how it's manufactured. And therefore, um, when we practice outside the Netherlands, uh, sometimes landscape architecture is associated with uh, the architect who just put the green. And there is an engineer doing the engineering and we just select species and plant a tree. Um, not the case in our background. We understand the soils, we understand what's below the soil, we understand the section, and therefore, um, when we practice landscape architecture, it's pretty much an engineer product because most of the time, these species are in urban conditions, are unstructured, and um, you are creating a second nature. You're creating nature to inhabit a place where they actually don't belong, but they need to feel they are part of nature because, yeah, they need to survive. So how can you do that? And in the French school, uh, landscape uh, is actually given because there is so much nature and vast nature. So what you're doing is you are sculpting nature to create scenery, to create sequences, to create uh, uh, beautification or to tailor it and trim it. While in the Netherlands school, you're creating a, a nature from, from water and you're creating a new ecosystem that is in somehow, yes, artificial, uh, but it's natural. So here are all these uh, dilemmas, but what we like to share is that we always see the opportunity that every time, and this is the nuance for the 21st century, we believe in an integrated approach. So every time that there is infrastructure, we believe it can be combined with nature, so infrastructure of the 50s used to be very hard. What I mean very hard, it used to be very little green on it. But now in the future, you can build with nature. And that is just the way of how you can combine infrastructure together with ecology, together with environment, together with sustainability. Therefore, roads, they no longer need to be concrete and asphalt and asphalt and concrete. Today, roads can be, you know, recyclable material on the asphalt mm -hmm. with bioswells, with silver cells for trees so they can grow longer roots with ecology and with pleasant environments to walk underneath. So you are desired to walk or bike under the shade. So here, a little bit of, you know, responding such a question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was amazing seeing like that transition. No, Tutti, yeah, Mariana. <laughs> I also so, have a question. Oh, Elif, yeah, you can type it in the chat and then you'll go after Mariana. And oh. then that way we can keep track of the questions too. So Mariana, if you want to introduce yourself, yeah, where are you hello. from? <laughs> I'm Mariana, I'm also from Caracas, Venezuela. Um, thank you so much for the lecture, it was great. Uh, I specifically loved when you spoke about the importance of collaboration with the locals for the art and the design of the pavement. Um, I think that's super important and interesting. And I guess I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit more on like how you in your personal practice or in the firm, like how you deal with this like introduction of a new culture when you're given a site that has a culture that is very different from your own. Like how do you try to to collaborate with the locals and Maybe you can give some other examples or just expand your thoughts on that. Sure. Oh, my God, a very good question. Um, I think it's very important to understand something that um, as you practice uh, is part of the profession and is part of being a responsible professional. That every time you begin a project, uh, there is a design process, step one. So uh, it's very important that the 
project that you do as a professional, you really honor your design process. And the step one of the design process is really the analysis and research of the place and location. So when you do your analysis, you really do a deep analysis that you go deep in the tissue and it's not just about the site. And in the cases we as landscape architects, we, we have to go further. So we go into site is tied to place. You know, site is tied to location, to a geography, to a climate, to an environment, to people, to culture. And when you hit the channel of culture, you're always in heritage, you're in history. And therefore you have to go through all those lenses to understand the place in which you're conceiving a future design. So it's very, very important. And we do it here in the studio. So in the case of um, including the ritual culture, when we were in, in Vallarta, we realized the fact that they were very much not taken into account. But for us as outsiders, we really uh, saw a potential there that they should have a voice. And that was our way of manifesting their voice. And um, we truly appreciate that it was well received. It could have been a no, so it was well received. And I think the part of the ownership was very much about the locals then manifesting, articulating that in contributing personally in putting the pebbles. But it doesn't happen only there. In this case was manifested in this fashion, for instance, um, in other places uh, has been manifested differently. For example, in Madrid, um, we did uh, a series of bridges to connect two neighborhoods that they were disconnected. And when we had the opportunity to do a linear park called Madrid Rio, we designed a bridge called Puente Cascara, the shell bridge, and we designed a few. And then we invited an artist, local artist, his name is Daniel Canogar, and he had a brilliant idea as an artist to photograph the neighbors. Uh, and we didn't understand the concept, but obviously when it was implemented, but it was a very pure idea because he photographed the neighbors and in which he then took that photography and he created on top of the bridge, a beautiful mosaic uh, with ceramics, very small, with the faces of the neighbors that once again are reunited because the two neighborhoods were divided for almost a century due to uh, uh, automobiles taking away the bridge from the people and uh, basically colonizing the river with roads. So the project was about removing and putting all the freeway underneath. So this was an analysis process where we thought in this case, we're gonna invite up and coming artists from the neighborhood. There was a selection process, a curation process, Daniel was selected and he came with this beautiful idea, which was about people. And it depends on every project, but to conclude on your question, I think the most important part of the project is not just the outcome of the design, but it's the research. The research and the analysis gives you all the answers in which you can then investigate how to establish your proposal. Thank you. Welcome. Um, uh, thank you, Daniel. It was, I'm Elif, by the way. Thank you for the amazing uh, lecture. It was very inspiring. Um, I guess my questions around like the term you used as building with nature, you know, with the problem our world is facing right now, climate change, with, you know, the groundwater storage is changing, the waterfall is changing, and then surface evaporation, all of these stuff. Um, like, I'm wondering, as a landscape architect, this, like, this problem is very, um, I guess, you know, in style, I don't know, in, like, style, I guess. Um, like, how would you, like, design around this problem? Or how are you, um, as, like, a design firm or, like, a landscape architect looking at this situation right now? Hi, yeah. it Pleased to meet you. It's a great question. And um, um, landscape architects actually are very much in a position in the world today and has a responsibility 
on every project they do, they need to respond to these challenges. And I think there is no site, I haven't come across the one first, that you're designing and you're not taking this into account. In the world of today, this is the starter to learn if you're on a coast area, okay, what is the sea level rise condition there? What is the projection of the sea level rise? Understanding the climate change, if it's by rain, understanding if it's a drought because it's not raining, so you shouldn't waste water. So it's pretty much in our awareness, but it has always been. I think now there is an extra layer of understanding to other people's outsider profession. So there is an increase in the, in the awareness and the sensibility, but it's pretty much in our conscious. So sometimes, most of the times where we do projects, the clients say, but don't forget about the sustainability and don't forget about you know, climate change and because they wanna make sure that we account it. But I wanna rephrase, before we start, we are very much aware and we start with that and every project we do, we make sure that responds to these challenges. And how do you do that? Well, it goes on a project by project basis. And I have to say landscape architects specifically, different than architects, architects, for instance, and you cannot do two projects the same. What I'm trying to say by that is that you design a project on a site and that site is in that unique location. So it's like a human, there's only one Elif, there's only one Daniel, there's no two Daniels. The same with projects. So you cannot copy paste the same response of one project into another project because we are very site oriented. While the architect, you know, if the developer wants can take the building and copy paste it uh, in Cairo or copy paste it in DC. It might not behave the same, it might not be sustainable, but it can be, it will be something very harmful for the environment because it will be waste of material and so it can be done. You can see warehouses, you, for instance, they're one type and it's applicable in different regions, for instance. But landscape architects are have a huge responsibility in this century. They're very much needed together with scientists and ecologists to make sure that there is a green transition into the world we live today for future generations to come. It's a must. Thank you. Um, hi, Daniel, I'm Maria. I'm uh, from Buenos Aires studying here at Ditela. And uh, if it's okay, I wanted to go back uh, to the first especially uh, when um, Latin American modernism. And I wanted to kind of like challenge that term in a way that like, I feel like there's, it should just be like architecture, like Ibasta, like there's architecture in Latin America and not Latin American architect architecture. Um, you showed in one of your slides, a picture of, uh, the exhibition at the MoMA about uh, Latin American uh, Latin American construction, and uh, like that exhibition, like one of one of the purposes of it was um, like to establish a dialogue with like uh, Hitchcock's exhibition that was uh, Latin American architecture um, and like the name of the like the new one, like Latin America in construction, like it's not casual, like uh, they're like denying like a Latin American architecture. And I wanted to know like, uh, what do you think about that? And also if you think that um, the way that each person thinks about it has to do with the fact that like you emigrated from Latin America into like the US, uh, because I think like the that plays a very important role in how like uh, you view like Latin American, uh, like architecture in Latin America as a whole. I'm, I'm not sure if the question is clear. No, no, it's very good. I think I believe a lot in the, the dialectica. So I think in the room of academia, these are the spaces where you can ask these questions to dialogue, to reflect, to hear back, to, uh, um, to 
discernir about uh, the thinking. So, uh, first of all, I, it's true that, uh, you know, the Latin American movement uh, in, the, in, in the 50s and modernism or modern architecture or brutalist architecture for some, um, uh, it has a posture and uh, some people love it, other people hate it. And uh, in uh, different parts of uh, Latin America had different uh, deviations. In the case of Venezuela specifically, or some in Colombia, for instance, uh, I think it had a good turn uh, because it was pretty much uh, trying to, uh, you know, behave with the environment and understand the context. And uh, even though when the Corbusier came to Latin America, he tried to, uh, you know, he 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 saw that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Villanueva had his spot, and, and 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 therefore maybe it could be too much of a conflict of interest. However. Um, what I, what I think uh, there are different layers. Layer number one is the fact that for some people, they consider the movement as maybe a movement that was a little bit harsh and not very friendly. But for me, uh, what I take away out of it is it was a hope. It was a hope and it's a reference to reinvent yourself, to be reborn, to uh, understand the identity that who we are as, as a continent and to where shall we look at? Obviously, there were inspirations and uh, reference like Ney Meyer and uh, yes, there are some uh, resembles on Corbusier and uh, metabolism. That's always the case in all of the styles. But what is very important is it was a hope and there was a hope for an a utopian to a new model. And if we look to the world of today, how long things takes to be achieved? Actually, I'm quite surprised and proud that, you know, they were able to do that in less than 20 years, you know? In less than 20 years, they imagined, they dream, they build it, and they did something. And I wonder if your generation or my generation will ever have the opportunity to do something like they did of the significance. And um, I think we always need to have uh, the challengers of one, to understand who we are and who we want to be. And if we don't know that, it's gonna be harder for us to move forward. So I think in that search of who we are, they found themselves. And maybe we as the next generation, some people might not identify themselves with that, fine. But then you have the uh, challenge to then, okay, you have to be in search of who we are and where we go as a collective. Um, and I think the answer is, uh, in my own opinion, to my own perspective, that Latin American cities are an ecosystem. They are there. They're part of the almost 500 years of history of urban settlements that now has grown into metropolis. And they need to be attended. And uh, there will be future uh, citizens that are clever people that need to be you know, taking care of with environment. And there's a lot of culture there. And I think as a second tier, going back to the, to the movement, I believe a lot on the Latin American as being the uh, epicenter for inspiration for utopia. So when uh, America was discovered or was encountered, let's put it like this, enable Europe to renaissance and reinvent themselves. And this is very important because thanks to us, the world renaissance, and thanks to us mutual, there was enlightenment and a series of processes departed from that. And therefore there is freedom and independence and all of these layers. And uh, Thomas More wouldn't be inspired in Utopia if America wasn't discovered. So I think that uh, the modern movement, uh, good or bad, what is important is that in the 50s, there was the search for an identity. And I think right now with everything that the current climate is going through, there is some sort of search of the people, where are we heading? What are the challenges? How can we defeat the problems of today? Such as the environment, I think it's very present. So it's good to look back, to look forward. That will be my answer. Thank you. Thank you.
And hi, Danielle. Thank you for that presentation. It was really inspiring. I really liked it. And I'm Ayal from Costa Rica, from San Jose. And I have a question about, maybe related to the last question about like who really makes Latin American architecture, if that's even a thing. And I wanted to know about your personal experience working with public versus private uh, uh, entities in Latin America or wh wherever. And because like I, I think about Latin American countries, which are mostly developing countries and their cities that have and the governments that work there, the people in power who are like many times have their own interests. I don't want to generalize, but they work for their own interests many times and, or just represent themselves or a small privileged minority. And like, if that is like, like we think public architecture, like from public, public funded architecture might be better for like society but is how different that is that from like from private funded architecture when they could be corrupted in the same way if that makes sense yeah no no i think your question is very much related to the sociological and anthropological aspects of uh, cities and you're absolutely right uh, there are some uh, uh, let's call them minorities in which they decide uh, which uh, shape uh, the cities will take or development will take and um, therefore uh, my advocacy to support uh, urban tissue what i mean by that to support public spaces uh, public spaces can also be developed by private developers why i um, uh, that um, is a way of uh, you know giving a piece of city to the people, sometimes are uh, privately owned, but publicly accessible, uh, famous word uh, known as POPAS. Uh, but it's very important that cities should have public domain and that the privatization of the public space is very much curated so that we don't end up that all the spaces are privatized uh, because then uh, everything is controlled recorded and the freedom becomes more and more constrained. Um, in Latin America, for instance, um, happens a lot with urbanization and suburbia, where, for instance, and uh, maybe this is a, a reflection, uh, many of low-income people happen to live more freely than people of high-income people that live more constrained because their freedom it's in jeopardy uh, due to security. So they end up growing middle class inclusively, uh, you know, in a segregated suburbia uh, with a gated community, uh, very hygienic and not aware of reality, which make us a bit innocent of true life, which also jeopardize our mental health uh, later in adulthood. Uh, while, for instance, um, um, uh, people of uh, uh, low income that grew up on the streets and they're not afraid of anything gives them a security that they will enter adulthood, you can see them actually um, having so much certainty when they go to public schools because they still exist or a public university and they will become very successful, but they just need to have access to education. Um, what I'm trying to say with this is that it is very important that eventually uh, urbanization take care in a public way. And I think Argentina in this case, taking a city as a domain, Buenos Aires, it's a very walkable street. It's a street where the door is at the sidewalk. Um, the same happens with Bogota and these kind of cities will ensure that societies, and that's why I believe so much in the tissue, meets and gather. And how to do that? Well, I believe that it does not need to come from the public government because the public is the one who should, it should be a little bit of both. It should be a balance and uh, that will make sure. So if you are a private developer and you give back, you will gain more 
because you are providing a plaza. Therefore, the people will be at the front of your retail. People will buy their eyes on the streets. And before you know it, you're applying Jane Jacobs principles. While if you are a developer old school, no, 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 I develop everything. I don't even give an inch uh, to public space because uh, that real estate is money and time is money, no way. Then you don't give that public plaza because you develop to the, all the way to the property line, but then people don't stop because it doesn't feel cool to drink a coffee in front of your building. Therefore, you go to the neighbor. You see, so these are the ecosystems. And, and this is a part of our job as architects and architects to convince our clients why it's a good idea to maybe set back the building a little bit, like Nice did, to make sure that his tower has more presence uh, than the other ones, um, for instance. So it's a little bit of anthropology and has to do a little bit with society, but our profession has to deal with that. And um, it's a long game and you have to be patient and you have to have a little bit of intuition and always try to convince and work um, towards the best of the common good. Thank you, that was great. You're welcome. Hi, um, I'm Hello. also Mariana and I'm also from Venezuela. Hi, and I'm, um, <laughs> uh, I'm from Caracas and I think it was really interesting seeing all of the landmarks that you showed us because most of them relate to me or my family somehow. Uh, and it's impressive how to see a country that evolved so much that those aren't places that I usually live around, places that I visit more, they're even considered more as like danger zones that you should try to avoid. And every time I meet someone new from a country, a developed country, for example, I always end up in the conversation of how we don't use the streets. Like I don't walk in the streets in Caracas and no one understands. And it was really um, interesting to me how you described briefly how um, authoritarian um, countries take the cities from the public, take the streets from the public and take the freedom of being in the street and how the streets become like a symbol of that. And so my question um, changed a little after your presentation, but I wanted to ask you, how do you activate the urban fabric in an undeveloped, underdeveloped country such as Venezuela? And what would you envision a future where the streets in Latin America are more than just transition space? Like what do you envision that to be? Uh, for me, streets are uh, actually uh, places to meet and gather, to places to encounter, uh, places to be inspired, places to interface. Um, that's what a street is. And they're very important and critical for the human as the place for society. Uh, this is where the memories are. And this is where you remember. I think it's very important, your question, because to part of our duty of uh, exchange of generations from my elders uh, to my contemporaries and to you is to actually document. Documenting is very important. And today was just a piece of documentation on history uh, in a verbal way, in a narrative. And I think it's very important that you are aware that those are streets that today they tell you don't go because it's dangerous. Actually, uh, they were designed for people to access them. They were designed to be experienced in a specific manner. And uh, I just want to let you know, as I explained the story of the role of the streets and the window as a form of display uh, to be actually uh, meeting people through the window was, was a way. So people was using the streets to circulate uh, for the common good. And the streets were actually places for people to walk. And not going too far away, um, I remember me actually walking from the high school in the middle of Caracas, all the way from, you know, Campo Alegre up to uh, Santa Fe. And it was such a trajectory and I had to take a bus and sometimes the metro and I was exposed and it was my first experience of freedom actually. Uh, being independent from my parents and being a responsible teenager. So I had the opportunity to live that. And yes, there were moments of tensions, but I lived, I was exposed and I had the opportunity. Today is different, 
But I also believe that those conditions will change as the ecosystem of the current political climate, not just there, but in other countries that are living in the similar situation changes. And not to go too far away, um, just to put an example, uh, not so long ago, we had the opportunity to do a project for the city of Cali, in which a donor, after being 20 years away of their city, he came back to give back to his city where he was born because people were taking over the street. There was a reborn and a re-renaissance after all the cartels were gone and the peace came through. So it's important to know that if it could happen 20 years after, why not it could not happen here eventually? So I think uh, there are two layers. There is the layer of what we call the physical infrastructure of the street. And the second layer is what we call the software, which is the soft infrastructure, which means political climate and doctrine, you know, freedom of speech, depending on what swings those spaces will actually inhabit for flourishing or will inhabit for terror. Thanks. Um, well, we're just about at eight. I does, does anyone else have any last questions they would like to ask um, before we start to close? Um, okay, I I had one last question that sure. sort of is an add on <laughs> add on to um, the previous question. But um, towards the end of your presentation, you were speaking about um, a lot of urban growth and urban tissues and the urban tissues as connectivity between these diverse networks. Um, and the idea of embracing the past within the now, and that's something that's a very strong presence. Um, but when we're looking at like these communities that are growing and diversifying with that growth, um, how do we not only start to embrace the past and the now, but also potentially uh, in, with what you just said about documentation, how do we start to embrace the present through the future so that what's the current networks and the current tissues uh, that you are connecting with this beautiful architecture aren't being then lost with the introduction of like um, new communities, anyone that might come and look at this beautiful work any how do we is that making sense sorry i have people outside but yeah no problem no i think that's a relevant question and you know um it's interesting because for instance uh, many people regret that um indeed uh, the urbanization uh, took so fast in caracas from the 1900 to 1940s and uh, actually uh, um, displace a lot of the beauty from that uh, colonial time. But at the same time was like, okay, we have evolved and we move on and uh, the modern movement came through and uh, there's very little leftover. So it's a pity that we didn't conserve or preserve enough. Um, on the other end, you have cities like Paris who they're all about keeping their nostalgia and therefore every time you want a new incision, you know, it's a luxury like the Pompidou is an exception. So they become like real jewels. And London is doing, I think, a better job into adapting into the future with all their kind of contemporary architecture in contrast with the Gothic and the history. So it becomes really eclectic. Um, I think there is also an important issue like New York, specifically speaking, which I had the opportunity to live and experience that there is a very strong community, although you have this capitalism very present and strong, overbuilt in Manhattan, actually it's a shell. And you see that true people don't live there and they come for business and they leave and then the weekend is kind of empty and you feel that it's not a real community and neighborhoods there are a little bit, uh, and then you go to Brooklyn, it's a completely, uh, you know, diverse, dynamic, rich, and uh, communities and neighborhoods are really alive. And um, that is also vibrant and it's important um, for cities that they are alive 
uh, cities like Venice, for instance, so beautiful, but tourism are really affecting the true ecosystem and uh, more and more, there are less Venetians and maybe one day will be completely extinct and it will become a theme park and maybe in this century even that before you fly to Venice, you gotta buy tickets and before you know it, it's another Disney. So I think it's so important that each generation does their job on documenting because documenting creates the awareness and if it's relevant, will be documented by someone. And in my case, I'm documenting a history of what I've been told and I don't want it to be lost. So I'm glad that today I was able to exchange without even knowing there were a few Venezuelans on the line, but at least they take away. So that's something that I learned at school that is very important to pass the button. And I'm sure you guys, when you are, you know, passing to your next generation, you're in the you, you, each one of you will find your motivation. And if it's meaningful, it will come to float. If it's not, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the bottom. And documentation is something very, very critical in our life. Uh, and it goes as simple as taking a picture and remember you have it, and then you tie it with a story and a narrative. So I think everything that is relevant, it will succeed on its own. Jared, I hope I answer. Um, and um, what is more important is that in academia and the group like yours as a student group is to reflect, uh, to embrace. And I would like to say again, like in the beginning, to elevate uh, uh, the different cultures and identity. And I think uh, in this case, America as a whole is truly an essence, uh, a melting pot, which is the beauty. And we as humans, the more we mix, the more we are enriching our cultures. So with that, uh, I wanna say thank you for you all for your time and attention. And we hope uh, that we reflect on this a little longer throughout our life. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for all Thank your you. words and perfect closing. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great weekend. Happy Friday, everyone. Likewise. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you.